Okay, is that working up the back? Good. Oh, down there. <laughs> um, okay, so today we're lucky enough to have a guest lecturer who won't be super guest like for a lot of you, as he's your tutor, but um, for some of you won't know Ben Abraham, who is completing a PhD in, uh, what did you say, virtual communities yeah, and that the, sort of... Yeah, uh, internet community and technology and stuff around that. Cool. So, yeah, internet community, technology, gaming, I don't know, all this, all this exciting stuff. Anyway, today he's going to talk about... Oh, yeah, bring the screen up. Um, today he is going to talk about the press, the player, the publisher and games, the kind of um, the economics but also the kind of cultural context of um, video games journalism, writing about video games, all that sort of stuff. So I'll hand over to Ben. Okay. Can you guys hear me up the back? Is that all right? Hooray! Yeah. Got a response. Excellent. Okay, so... Uh, I'm talking about the press, the players, the publishers, the games, it's a, around the broad theme of game journalism today. Um, so I'm going to begin with a question. How does a developer get their game to a player in 2012? Well, there are actually like a ton of ways. Um, for most large games, for like large game companies, AAA developers, anyone... Um, so for any large studio from t between 20 to 200 people, it will still go through a bricks and mortar store. Um, so like EB Games, Gamesman, Electronic Boutique, all the rest of them. Um, and it will go through a publisher to that. But there's also all these other sort of alternative distribution platforms that are sort of turned up. Um, so like Steam, Steam Greenlight, Kickstarter, uh, and a whole bunch of websites that you can, you know, put your game on and get some attention through. Um, particularly, like, you know, indie game blogs, TIG Source, free indie games blog. Do any of you read any of these, like, game blogging websites? No? Yeah? Okay, a couple hands. All right, sweet. So, where, but, yeah, so the question, where did this audience for these, like, crowdfunded stuff come from? So if, if you, as in you sitting in there in the audience, are developing a game and you want people to play your game, where do you connect with your audience? How do you build that audience um, if you want to get it on green light? How do you stop it from languishing in the green light slums where no one knows about it or on Kickstarter where, you know, you end up with three backers and they're all your relatives and friends? Um, well... You still have to go through this thing that we call the enthusiast press. And you know this as sort of the games journalism industry. Um, but the enthusiast press is a really good term for it, I think. Um, so, and this includes everything from like Rock, Paper, Shotgun to Kotaku, Edge Online, Eurogamer, magazines like Hyper, um, official game mags, official PlayStation mag, if any of them are still around, um, and sites like The Brainy Gamer, Kill screen, TIG source, all the rest of them. Um, so, think about this. At one point in time, Notch, who you guys will know as the guy behind Minecraft, had to build an audience. Like, at one point in whenever it was, 2006, 2007, 8, or whatever, no one knew who Notch was. And he had to build an audience through the enthusiast press. Um, so, but let, let's jump back in time for a minute. It wasn't always like this, um, because let's jump back to the 1970s. Why the 1970s? Well, that's sort of the beginning of video games, video game journalism. So I'm going to go right back to the source. Um, and let's put ourselves in the position of a developer in the 70s, at sort of the earliest period of video games. So there was no internet, therefore no Steam or any other digital distribution platform, no Kickstarter, none of the websites I mentioned, definitely no blogs, just physical stores and this weird thing that has become increasingly rare, the video game magazine. Does anyone subscribe to a video game magazine anymore? Okay, one of you, two of you? All right, that's about what I expected, like maybe two people out of, what have we got here, like 60 or something. So for a long time, though, the video game magazine was the primary um, gateway between a developer and an audience. It, uh, and video game mags were the first and only way that developers could connect with audiences, and journalists who wrote in 
gay magazines had an incredible amount of influence over the number of incredibly important aspects of what we think of as sort of video game culture, what we value about games, what we value in games. Um, so today's lecture is all about the history of video game journalism and writing about video games more broadly and the ways it is controlled and continues to control the language um, and the culture around games and to some extent how it determines how we even engage with games. Okay, so why do we engage with games the way that we do? Well, partly it's to do with this huge complex regime of um, video game magazines and, and journalists and the press and publishers and all this sort of stuff. Um, so this, this lecture is divided into sort of two parts. First, I'm going to talk about game journalism history. So in the past, um, I'm going to talk about the broader sort of roots of video game journalism within tech industry writing and the implications it has for like how we frame discussions about games. Um, then I'm going to talk about... Um, the specific forces that drove journalists to make the decisions that they make, the things that they cover, you know, to... Basically, if I'm giving the impression that journalists are somehow the magical gatekeepers of everything, um, I want to also add to that picture certain forces that they have to be aware of. So things like business models and audience figures and stuff like that. Um, and then the third thing I'll talk about in the first part is games journalists as enthusiasts. So this history of games journalists being expected to be really, really enthusiastic about games to the point where most game journalists in the past were even hired because they knew more about games than they did about, say, writing or journalism or any of that sort of stuff. Um, and that has like a big impact on the way that we think about games and write about them. So, and then I'll jump to the present and talk about the current effects of other things um, on games journalism and the industry around it. And so primarily I'll be looking at the effects of the internet because that is basically the single biggest impact on games journalism to date. Um, and then I'll talk about the way that it's reconfigured the press-publisher relationship. So wh what a journalist does um, and how they interface with a publisher or a developer. Um, and the way that the business model that has had to evolve and adapt to sort of this online uh, space. And then finally I'll talk about the new games journalism movement which kind of e emerged out of um, a sort of community of bloggers in the mid-2000s who sort of were, were not quite journalists but they weren't quite just players either. They, they were sort of critics and, and they were really interested in, in doing things with games. Um, so that's the, the two parts of it. So let's jump back to 1981. This was the first ever game magazine launch, Computer and Video Games. Um, and it was launched in Britain in October. 1981 was the year that Gallipoli came out in theatres. You might have seen that in high school. It's a Mel Gibson film. Um, it was also the year that Justin Timberlake was born. And it was the year that my parents roughly sort of got together around about then. Um, so, 1981 was an illustrious, illustrious year. According to Kevin Gifford, an expert on the video game mag history, inside the illustrious pages of computer and video games, um, it contained not just game announcements and tips for arcade games, but also columns on programming in BASIC and successfully building a Sinclair ZX81 computer kit. So you can already see, this is not the kind of game mag we're used to today, right? It's much more like something you'd expect this guy to be reading, right? It's not the sort of thing that we would have picked up off the shelves and um, leafed through for the latest Mario game. It was a very, very different type of um, uh, publication. So you can already start to see this was like not... Um, yeah, sorry, I already mentioned that. So in 1981, just a little bit after that, a US-based magazine came out called Electronic Games. And Gifford says of it that just like computer and video games, which was the British version, um, electronic games irrevocably defined British game mags. Sorry, I'm confusing myself. Electronic game style became the prototype for nearly every US magazine that followed it. Terms like Easter egg, scrolling, and screenshot were originally coined by editor Bill Kunkel for the editorial. Yes, someone had to invent these terms they didn't exist back then, and the magazine became both a vital gamer resource and something of a trade mag for the home video game industry. 
So these terms are really important, right? Like, like things like screenshot and side, you know, scrolling or Easter egg, you know. Someone had to invent these terms. They didn't just like drop out of heaven. Um, someone had an idea about them, you know, and, and they carried a particular idea about what games were. Unfortunately for both mags, the infamous 983 crash was right around the corner um, and in 1984 ad sales for electronic games were so low that the editors were, were replaced and the mag went in an entirely different direction focusing on productivity and electronic toys um, rather than video games. And in the years that followed, game mags bounced back with hundreds of, um, hundreds of them sort of springing up across the world from UK, the US to Australia, everywhere. Um, reaching a sort of high point in terms of readership and circulation numbers in the 90s, right as the internet was taking off. Um, so another curious fact about these magazines is that they tended to follow the technological platforms that the games were played on. So Gifford again says that pretty much every major PC or game system over the years enjoyed at least two or three monthly mags dedicated exclusively to it in just the UK and with more popular platforms like the Amiga or the PlayStation getting a good six or seven at once. So the reason the UK managed so many magazines as well, and, and it was quite different from the US in that respect, the US sort of had you know, fewer of them with like larger um, readerships, is the fact that the UK was a really small country, right? Um, so distribution costs are smaller, Gifford notes. Publishers can keep magazines of circulations that would make their US counterparts pass out and still make a profit. So there's all these things that are impacting the history of games journalism that we don't normally think about. We, we sort of tend to you know, put them to one side and say, all right, that's not really relevant to games. Games are just whatever is on the screen. And I want to tell you that that's sort of um, a very sort of limiting perspective. Um, so... And it also starts to make sense um, when we understand that video game magazines were first an offshoot from tech journalism. Um, I mean, it seems really obvious today that games just are technology. I mean, they obviously are. But we also spend a whole lot of time debating whether or not games are art, or whether they're culture, or whether they're text, or, you know, all these other things. Um, so it's interesting. We could imagine a counter history. So instead, if... Um, rather than ZX Spectrum kit builders being the people who did these early game mags, imagine if it was some kind of art editor or some art historian. Imagine if some really foresight, in, um, some really insightful or foresightful um, editor looked at games and said, that's going to be the future. Um, let's treat that as the, the coming artistic revolution. What, what kind of a history of magazines and journalism we'd have? I think it'd be quite different. Um, and it's also worth asking whether these early tech writers were actually even doing journalism at all. Um, so, like, what is journalism? Um, and once upon a time, journalism was a really specialized field. It um, employed hundreds of highly trained professionals to gather and investigate, create, edit, sub-edit, collate, publish, print, tie up, and deliver news to newspapers and to individuals all around the country. Um, and, you know, mostly this was for daily newspapers. One important feature of um, the institutional form of newspaper journalism was a certain distance between the sort of sales department and the journalists themselves. Um, so the people who had to sell the paper were entirely separate from the people who wrote the news and the content um, for the, the newspaper. And they also had this big thing called classified sections, which is where, you know, anyone went who wanted to sell a boat or a car or a truck or whatever, um, they'd, you know, post an ad in the classifieds. The internet, when it came along, totally destroyed the market for print-based classifieds because everyone could just pop online for free and didn't have to leaf through all this paper and, you know, search was obviously better. So kind of undermined this really crucial business model element for journalism. But magazines never really had that kind of arrangement. So they made up the difference by charging extra for their cover price, costing less to produce, um, having fewer staff, and through taking on more advertising. Um, and this is where sort of the problem begins between the relationship between the publishers and the devs and the journalists. So I'm going to talk about the business model of um, games journalism or tech journalism generally. Um, so one of the things about advertisers is they want to see some kind of return for investment, right? 
Traditionally, they want eyeballs, so they want people to see their advertisements. And, and what, what does this really mean? Well, in a typical magazine, um, a journalist is going to feel a little bit of pressure to increase reader numbers. You know, they want more eyeballs because they want to get paid more. They want to, you know, do things with and the, with their life. Um, and so, um, and this could be like fine or totally acceptable or really, really problematic, particularly in the 90s when game mag subscription levels started to drop off um, and, and a whole bunch of magazines started to be consolidated and um, people kind of went for the lowest common denominator, which is obviously a problem. Um, so contrary to popular sentiment online, video game journalists are actually not stupid and they know that they can't all rush to the bottom. And usually, they want to produce good work that you know readers will value. So, um, as we'll see in a moment, this like when the internet came along and undermined the whole print journalism business, um, it presented like a huge problem. But there's another aspect that creeps into games journalism, and it's sort of been there from the start, um, and that is this fan mentality. I don't know if you can you see that that picture. Um, so that's like a bunch of fans at an E3 press conference, and they're all holding up cameras, and they're, ooh, really, they're leaning in, you know, they're really excited. Um, so the level of enthusiasm required for most games journalist positions was, like, seriously high. Um, and it needs to be, because otherwise, why the heck are you going to do this job for, like, almost no money? Games journalism has been, like, historically extremely poorly paid. Um, and that's part of, like, this vicious cycle between... Um, I guess the, the level of enthusiasm required and the amount of people who basically want to and are willing to replace you. So if you're a veteran game journalist and you've been doing it for 10 years and you, all right, you're ready to start a family and you want to you know, be able to get a mortgage, um, and there's like 50 straight out of college students ready and willing to take over your job and replace you, and you know, live on ramen noodles and live in a share house with seven other people um, and basically do your job for half the pay, then that's going to be a problem for you, particularly when you go to ask for a raise and stuff. Um, everyone kind of wants to be a journalist. Oh, and there's uh, you know, another, another famous thing is um, you know, people living off of the swag that they get from you know, publishers and publisher events, so free t-shirts and ramen noodles and stuff. Um, and this isn't me like making stuff up. Like some of my friends are like, you know, the peak video game journalists in the world, and they sometimes struggle to pay rent. Um, now, if journalists are as influential in shaping the games discourse as I've been claiming, then like this is a really big problem, because the impact of having a largely underpaid, largely precariously employed workforce um, is going to be pretty significant. No wonder games journalism has such a spotty history, right? I mean, we're just getting what we pay for. The other major feature of, um, of the traditional games journalist role is um, the preview event, or, or performing previews, and which are basically like unpaid advertisements for upcoming games. Um, and in a preview, there's this sort of unwritten contract between the developer and the journalist that says that they're going to be... Um, you know, upbeat or positive. One of the biggest press events every year is E3, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, which features literally hundreds of games journalists to preview games prior to their release. Um, according to Rebecca Carlson, the author of one of the best academic articles on games journalism around, she says that E3 demonstrates an economy that producers and journalists have built on each other. Developers need previews to create the desired hype and buzz around forthcoming games, and journalists need trade shows like E3 to fill up the magazines and web pages. So it's like this sort of Scratch my back if you scratch your... Um, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. That's the one. Um, Carlson also identifies a tacit understanding between developers and journalists that previews will always be positive advertisement-like presentations. Um, and so they're always positive, they're upbeat, or at least they're reserved anyway. Um, and there's kind of a good reason for that, right? Like, the game's unfinished. You don't want to come off as, like, a douchebag who's, you know, unfairly maligning a game that's sort of halfway through development. So there's all these forces that impact on the ways that games journalists can write about games um, and convey information to us about games. Carlson also says that the idea that games journalists work positively for the benefit of consumers to provide them with honest and straightforward opinions without the framework of the market interceding is largely a myth 
their ability to sell advertising space and to provide subscribers and site visits remains dependent on the positive benefits of working closely, if not entirely ethically, with producers. So that's like publishers and developers. Games journalists exert an influence on games themselves and on what gaming audiences see as important. Carlson also says that game journalists are not just direct conduits of value and knowledge. Um, they also are explicit gatekeepers, determining the kind of knowledge that is passed on to consumers and structuring the ways that gamers are in turn able to evaluate that knowledge. Okay. So I spent a bunch of time talking about journalism and business models and boring 80s history and all that sort of junk, um, stuff that isn't really like games, um, but all of which is like really important to our understanding. So let's jump forward to the present and see how this stuff is relevant today. And basically, um, we're living through the internet era, and that is one of the, like, the single defining issues for games journalism. So the first thing to note is that the net offered readers a more attractive product or service than traditional print-based mags. What was the use of getting a slab of dead trees every month in the mail if you could, you know, just end up reading about everything that you'd seen online the week before? Um, the internet did to video game journalism, um, what it did to video game journalism was largely an acceleration or a collapsing of time and space and things like that. So. A journalist goes to E3, that evening they will post up their reactions. You know, it's like this, this really, really hyper-fast cycle. Kotaku posts something every 30 minutes of every single day, pretty much without, without stopping. Um, and tons of mags just couldn't keep up. The early to mid-2000s was a period of intense consolidation in the game industry, sorry, gay mag industry. Um, but at, at this point, most of the interesting stuff in games writing was already moving online. Um, to like blogs and websites. So I'm going to stop talking about mags now and we'll talk about like websites. But I want to introduce you to this guy. His name is Sean Baby. Has anyone heard or seen of Sean Baby before? Okay, so one of the coolest things about the early internet era was the way that just about anyone could start a website or a blog and if they posted really good stuff they could build up a decent readership. With the best stuff um, Sorry, with the, yeah, with the best of these becoming mini celebrities in their own right. Sean Baby did exactly that, and according to Brandon Boyer, the head of the IGF, and a rant he gave at GDC in 2010, the damage that he did to audience expectations about video game journalism was pretty major. So I'm just going to tab over now to show you a short video of Brandon Boyer's rant from GDC 2010. One of the independent movement's true champion. Brendan Boyer. Hey, everybody. So, not surprisingly, my speech is kind of close to Ryan's. Uh, we're the two like press dudes here, so it's all right. Uh, mine has more dogs and suits. Um, so, I'm Brandon. I'm a very professional video game journalist. Uh, I've written for Edge Magazine, Gamma Sutra, Off World, and Boing Boing. Uh, we'll see what happens next. If you want to know, you can just Google Brandon or whatever. So a lot of people think that my day is a lot like this. As a very professional game journalist, uh, they think I'd spend all day on PlayStation 2. That's not actually true. Most of my day looks like this. Uh, I spend hours and hours a day just reading the internet. Uh, and I read a lot of the internet. Uh, any games blog I can get my hands on, any developer site, I subscribe to TigSource through RSS. I bring in as much of the internet as I can through this one channel. And when you do that, when you take in media kind of omnisciently like this, you start to see like patterns emerge and you get to see how like news ripples out. Uh, so this was a story that came out in December that the, uh, the PSP Go would be getting a third party UMD drive. Uh, everybody reported on it, but most people actually did say, you know, this is just kind of rumored based on an anonymous source. Uh, IGN themselves actually reported on this as well, and if you can't see it up there at the top, a couple days later they updated the story. Uh, so in order to see the, the update, you have to scroll all the way to the bottom, and once you get there, you see that this is actually not something that's happening, but they hide it all the way down there. So I'm not here to really, like, take pot shots at, like, lazy journalism. Uh, there's a, a deeper, deeper problem. And what that is, is uh, it's a very institutional problem. So websites, you know, earn money through hits. And the way you ensure steady hits is you get all these monkeys and time to typewriters and make sure they do something like every half hour or so. So like Kotaku, which I'm not slagging Kotaku. Uh, so Kotaku posts something every 30 minutes, pretty much like clockwork. Uh, but there's a bigger problem, I think, with the press. 
and that's what I'm here to talk about, and that's this. So uh, this guy is probably not familiar to most of you, but this is Sean Baby. Uh, so back in the late 90s and early aughts, Sean Baby rose to like minor internet stardom by doing these web features and eventually a stint at EGM magazine uh, that would just kind of like knock down bad, shitty retro games and casual games. And that was sort of amusing for a while, but I think that ultimately Sean Baby has ruined video game journalism for an entire generation. With apologies to Alan Lick there. So what do I mean by this? Uh, what Sean Baby and his imitators taught the aspiring writers of the day that all you needed to do to be a video game journalist was have an Xbox and a sneer, that entertaining trumped informing, and that this was a perfectly valid approach to reporting. But let's clear that up now. That's not. Your only job as part of the games press, what you presumably get paid for, is to inform your readers, to do the research necessary to provide context and insight for people who don't do this for a living. If you're not doing this, you're wasting our time. But more damaging, I think, is that Sean Baby helped create and formalize a cult of personality celebrity culture where the person behind the byline was the spotlight focus rather than the subject they were covering. This gives the press a false sense of entitlement, that they're somehow part of the story, and that leads to a lot of spilled words that, again, do nothing but waste our time. And I'm not trying to say that no one's doing it right or that there isn't room for like the lighter side of the news or that there aren't legitimate big targets that deserve to be taken down, but this is far more pervasive than it should be. So here's the traffic averages for five different gaming sites. There's actually five lines there. I'll give you three guesses as to uh, which of the lines there represents the ones that are doing it right. In, they're at the bottom. And this is exponentially more important for the people in this room right now, the people without multi-million marketing budgets behind them. These are the honest people struggling to make something beautiful every day. They desperately need the press to not only take them seriously, but to take themselves seriously at the same time. So what do I want? What I want is for 2010 to be the year we sunk snark, the year the press broke free of irony, took itself seriously, and ushered in an era of sincerity. I don't know how many of you remember these old ads for Grit magazine. Uh, the kids would sell these door to door in exchange for like football helmets and harmonicas. Uh, it's not really important that you know Grit magazine, but I recently stumbled on a quote from one of the magazine's founders to an, his employees. And it goes on, always keep Grit from being pessimistic, avoid printing those things which distort the minds of readers and make them feel at odds with the world, blah, blah, blah. So 120 years later, the quote, even though it's sort of touchy-feely and kind of hippie-ish, still feels like something woefully absent from the media. There are a lot of brilliant things happening around us, many of them from people sitting right here in this room, and I'd much rather see the press help raise them up than spend time knocking people down. So in summary, thank you very much. Okay, so that was Boyer's rant at the uh, at the at GDC in um, 2010. So what is um, what is he saying in this video? Well, he's basically making the same argument as me that there's a deep institutional or systemic or cultural problem that affects much of the stuff that gets written about games in the sort of popular press or the enthusiast press. Um, specifically regarding blogs and the internet, he's pointing to a change that happened. Um, from print culture to the onset of this sort of internet, digital publishing, blogging, micro-blogging, and the kind of like micro-celebrity stuff um, that it allowed. So what was so wrong about Sean Baby's work was that it, it meant that it... Um, sorry, what, it, what was so wrong about it that ruined video game journalism for an entire generation was that it was snarky, right? It was cynical. It was, uh, it was everything that was wrong with video game journalism today. It's like... It was like exclusionary, it was very bro, it was very, I'm like trying to come up with adjectives for it, but I mean you can kind of get the idea. Um, if you look at the tone of, a, of games writing from the 80s and the, you know even early mid 90s with you know the games journalist stuff from the mid 2000s, it's like really really clear the, the change that has sort of happened in this shift to online. Um, Look at like something like Nintendo Power magazine. It was like it was really fun, right? It was really cool. I mean, it was a bit dorky, all right, sure, whatever. But it wasn't ever like offensively snarky. It was never really hostile towards the audience, um, or hostile to a certain subset of the audience, maybe. Um, there's a lot more joy, you know, in in things like Nintendo Power magazine, even though it was like, you know, it was unapologetically pro-Nintendo. I mean, it was 
an industry publication and was owned and run by Nintendo, but partly it was just a young industry, right? It was sort of like the plucky upstart um, rather than the cultural juggernaut that it is today. So it's kind of, yeah, it was kind of nicer, I guess. Um, so the lesson from Sean Baby's success was that according to Boyer, all you needed to do to be a game journalist was have an Xbox and a sneer. That was the attitude towards journalism that sort of peaked in the, um, in the middle 2000s. And basically, it's like a cultural problem, right? Um, and a very particular cultural problem. It's really hostile to outsiders. It's got this vocabulary that's really, really specific. Like, look at all these words. Screenshot, visceral, interactive, replayable, fun, meaningful, enjoyable. Like unless you're like deeply embedded within the culture of games and games journalism and the enthusiast press, if I said to someone on the street, oh, this game is really replayable, they'll be like, they'll look at me funny, right? Um, because what does replayable even mean? Like, I mean, okay, we can kind of guess at a, a meaning, but it doesn't really tell me anything about why it's replayable. It's like, great, every book is re-readable. So what? What does that tell me? Um, so I'm trying to get you to think about this sort of, the, the way that the language about games and the way that we talk about them has been shaped by um, games journalism in like a really important way. But Boyer's rant was part of a, um, a sort of small but growing pushback against this kind of snarky journalism and this sort of celebrity culture. Um, and one of the other things that the internet did at the same time though was it um, allowed players to connect directly with developers. So whether via Twitter or a blog or whatever, um, you know, suddenly developers didn't have to go through these sort of games journalist conduits. Um, and you didn't have to go through like the cult of personality of, you know, all these people. So think about Notch again. Notch has 1.3 million Twitter followers, right? He could, he could tweet about anything and like 1.3 million people would just about see all of it. Um, you know, depending on who's like awake or whatever at the time of day. But like with retweets and stuff, you know, he, he has an incredible amount of influence and a huge, huge voice, way outside the, um, the audience levels of, of any gaming journalist. Um, and so social media obviously isn't fulfilling all of the same roles that, that journalism used to fulfill, um, but it's, it's reduced the need for games journalists as intermediaries between publishers and, and players. And I already talked a bit about the way that um, game journalists contribute to this sort of like the values of, um, of, you know, the things that we value about games. You know, the, the kind of words that we use tell us about the things that we value, right? You know, if, we, if we're saying, oh, this game is really, really visceral, right? It's telling us that we value something about viscera, I guess. Um, or, you know, ent entrails, guts, bleeding. Um, but... Um, the business model of games also changed when it moved online. Um, and, so, and so did the press-publisher relationship. Um, and there's one story that sort of illustrates this change like really well. Um, and that's the story of this guy, Jeff Gerstman, what got called Gerstman Gate. So in 2007, Jeff Gerstman, who was a, a writer for GameSpot at the time, and he, he's now like a, a owner and part, I guess part owner and run runs the, uh, the Giant Bomb community site. Um, at the time, he wrote a review of the now faded into obscurity game, Kane and Lynch. Um, the publisher, Idos Interactive, who also publishes this, the uh, successful Hitman series, didn't like the review very much, um, especially since they paid so much for all this sort of favorable advertising pre-release. Um, and... Um, yeah, across like the whole GameSpot website. So they had this really big deal that was worth a bunch of money, and I guess IDOS felt that you know they were entitled to some kind of good reward based on um, you know you know outlaying all this money. They want some kind of return on investment. Now, Ingo Kroll, who um, wrote the piece that is in this week's reading, which if you've uh, checked it out yet, it's it's really really good. I mean, go read that piece. It is fantastic. It is just a really really excellent example of great games journalism done really, really well, and just a really great piece of writing too. Um, he said that the, or he talks about the way that the deal with the devil that the enthusiast press has made with advertisers who, um, you know, other people who make and sell games, because they're usually the publishers, um, has become increasingly Faustian over the years. So if you guys know the story of Faust, he was the guy who made the deal with the devil and, you know, 
didn't end well, let's just say. Um, and Engo Kroll talks about the increasingly compromised relationship between sites like GameSpot, who, as part of their business model, sell metrics data to publishers um, and the shops that end up buying them from the publishers to sell to customers. Engai says that once marketing departments at various publishers began to formally integrate services like IGN's Gamer Metrics and GameSpot's Tracks into their promotional plans, and when retailers started to factor that data into their product orders, so when they started buying or deciding how many copies of a game they'd buy based on how many people had seen it online, that's when um, an obvious incentive for publishers to manipulate those services to boost awareness sort of cropped up. Um, and so this is a change that was brought about by the web and kind of erodes the traditional barriers between the journalist and the advertisers and this sort of like sales and editorial department that I sort of talked about a little bit at the beginning with this history of um, traditional, indust uh, the I traditional institution of journalism. Um, and so in the past, when you sold a magazine, all you could tell the publisher was maybe how many people read the magazine, so maybe 100,000 people saw it, and then probably most of them read the advertisement, but you couldn't say whether or not they cared, whether they went out and told their friends about it, or whether they went and bought the game. You know, Publishers would have to make some kind of educated guess about the effects of their advertising. But as soon as you moved online, publishers start to know exactly how many people are, are looking at their ads, who are seeing the coverage, and if they're Sites like GameSpot, if they have like profiles, they'll probably know something about de demographics of the viewers, um, whether the reader was male or female, whether they clicked on the link, whether they, um, you know, moused over it or something. You know, all of these metrics are like totally capturable online, and they are captured um, because companies make a profit of selling that sort of data off. Um, and so, what happened in Gerstmann's case was never really clear, um, but it seemed very very much from the outside that IDOS Interactive complained about the negative review um, and you know so there's some examples of the coverage they had so that was like the front page of GameSpot um, and it's got those big banner ads behind it um, and you know wanted the, the review changed either toned down or you know pulled entirely or, or whatever um, and so Gerstmann got fired. But usually, like, one really bad review, it wouldn't be enough to get you fired. And there was some suggestion that maybe he wasn't performing or whatever. Um, you know, he wasn't doing his job properly. Um, but a bunch of anonymous insiders sort of left comments and said that, well, this is part of a longer trend for the sales people to get involved in editorial and blah, blah, blah. You can see where the end result of this is, right? It's an obviously a problem. How can a reader trust a website who is allowing its publication content to be bought? Um, and now, after the Gerstmann thing, a whole lot of publications, I think, sort of cleaned up their act a bit, and they realized that the end result of this was not good. Um, they realized that readers are not stupid and will be turned off by too much advertising content disguised as editorial. Meanwhile, in the mid-2000s, um, a number of really interesting blogs sort of sprung up online. So Insert Credit was one of the first ones. Um, the Brainy Gamer is a really great blog written by a theatre professor. Um, took off in 2007 and has like gotten a million, several million hits between now and then. Um, a number of others include like Game Set Watch, Off World, Nightmare Mode, Split Screen, and Rock Paper Shotgun, a site founded by four ex-UK British game mag journalists to do online PC gaming coverage, which finally brings me to the topic of new games journalism, because one of the founders of Rock Paper Shotgun was this guy, Kieran Gillen. Um, now, new games journalism was a thing that sort of emerged around about the same time and actually came out of that sort of online blogging milieu, that sort of community. It started on a, on a website called State, where a lot of people would talk about games in a very particular way. They'd discuss them not just analytically about like mechanics and um, you know, whether it was a good game, whether it was really visceral, whether it was, you know, all of that sort of stuff, but they talked about it very differently. And so Gillen wrote this manifesto called the New Games Journalism Manifesto, and, and he gave it this name. Um, and the, the definitive piece of New Games Journalism, and the one that everyone goes back to, because, you know, for really good reason, it's a really fantastic piece of writing, is called Bow Nigger. And I won't talk about it too much, but um, if you're at all interested in what really good writing about games looks like, go and read that piece, because it is just phenomenal. It still holds up incredibly well. Um, 
And there were sort of two prongs to Gillen's argument. He sort of summarized what New Games Journalism was about and why it, would, it was sort of an interesting perspective. Um, rather than being an offshoot of the sort of analytical tradition of breaking down a game and analyzing why its mechanics worked, um, it was much more about the experience, and it was really, really experiential. So if, if, has anyone read Stephen Poole, his type of stuff? Um, he was the prototypical sort of analytical um, writer about games. You know, he'd break down the mechanics and say, all right, this game is really cool, Civilization's really great because X, Y, Z, um, and isn't it really interesting how blah, blah, blah happens, and that feels really good when, you know, we get a new tech tree level or something. You know, it tickles something in our brain, and he kind of analyzed it in that sort of way. New Games Journalism took a completely different approach, and it totally rejected the idea of the the analytical breakdown as sort of summarizing what a game is about. Um, Kieran Gillen said that New Games Journalism um, argues that the worth of a video game lies not in the game, but in the gamer, so in the player themselves. Now, this is kind of like a really weird, fairly radical interpretation of like what a game should be or, or what the worth of a game is. Um, and he says that what a gamer think, feels and thinks as this alien construct takes over all their sensory inputs is what's interesting here, not just the mechanics of how it got there. Games have always been digital hallucinogens, but games journalism has been like chemistry, discussing the binding reactions to brain sites. What I'm suggesting says what it feels like as the chemical kicks in and reality is remixed around you. So it's experiential writing. It's really, really literary. Um, and it takes like a hell of a lot of skill. In fact, it, it takes more writing chops than it does than the analytical sort of style where you just sort of break down mechanics and, and talk about it. Um, and this is probably partly why it's so often done really poorly. Like there are heaps and heaps of examples of really bad new games journalism. Um, lots of like, whoa, this was a really amazing experience. This happened to me. Then this happened. Then this happened. And then an explosion. And then, whoa, it was the best game ever. Um, you know, all, all caps and stuff like that. Um, but that's a really poor description of an experience. But one of the benefits of like a really experiential pro approach, the, 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 uh, the focus on craft, um, and, like the, and the writing itself, that it was actually really, really good because the history of games journalism is littered with unexceptional writers and journalists who in the old days were often employed more for their knowledge and skill at games than they were at, for their ability to communicate with their audience. Um, and so the second implication from um, the attempt to describe what it's like as you play a game, you know, this new games journalist paradigm, um, is that, uh, as Gillen says, in video games there is no there, right? So there's no actual place, it all, it's all imaginary. You're either sitting in front of your PC or slumped in your front room, controller in your hand. It's all happening inside your head, induced by the sound and light you're bombarded with. Um, alters, oh, sorry, I lost my spot. Induced by how the sound and light you're bombarded with alters depending on your whim and inclination. You're experiencing something that simply doesn't exist. This is the game's form's own peculiar magic and what we have to explain. And this means that writers in the new game journalism style are more like travel writers. They're more like... Um, people who go to you know, a foreign country and bring back an interesting story or a, a tale about what the culture is like in a place. Gillen says the travel journalists, um, New Games journalists are travel journalists to imaginary places. Our job is to describe what it's like to visit a place that doesn't exist outside the gamer's head. Um, and the gamer, not the game itself, right? That's what the point of the New Games journalist thing is about. It's about getting inside the head of the gamer and explaining um, what that experience is like. Go to a place, report on its cultures, foibles, distractions, and bring it back to entertain your readers. This approach couldn't be further from a ludological sort of approach, you know, that sort of, let's analyze the rules of chess and see where it's really interesting. You know, it's, it's totally different than that. It's all about, like, what it felt like to play the game, to be this person in the game, um, to do these things. And it's actually a really generous way of approaching games, right? Um, it takes games seriously. It says this isn't just fun. This can be a really meaningful experience on par with, um, you know, when you go on a date or when you go dancing at a club or when you discover the bank has given you an extra $500 and they let you keep it, you know? All of these sort of really exciting, interesting experiences that sort of captivate us, right? 
Um, and weirdly enough, sites like Rock Paper Shotgun have become really, really successful. RPS is quite literally the largest um, gaming website in the English-speaking world. They still do typical news reporting, um, like announcing games and sharing trailers and images, but some of their most read and most commented pieces are examples of new games journalism um, or cultural criticism about like the failures of the game industry and stuff like that. And crucially, they still have an advertising department. They make money, um, but it's like the departments are separate. It's handled by other people, and it's not bought and sold and, and all the rest of it. And they manage the distance. Um, so that's basically it. That's my little summary um, of video game history or sort of the important bits or the um, things that I think are important. So I, first I talked about the history of game mags in, in tech journalism and what that sort of did to the development of game mags and game mags. Um, I've been messing that word up. Um, and I talked about game journals as both like enthusiasts and mediators of value. So like they are the gatekeepers to new games and they decide what is worth talking about. You know, if they see a game that a publisher really wants to push and, and they say, mm -mm, my readers aren't going to be interested in this, then that's what happens. Or well, that was the case, anyway, in the mag sort of space. Um, and then finally, in a sort of historical sense, game journalists shaped what we valued about games. You know, they defined the terms that we use to talk about games, the way we think about games and um, and discuss them. And then in the present, games journalism has been radically altered by the internet. It's been like sort of shattered. It's been undermined. The business model has been totally changed. Um, the internet brought up this sort of celebrity culture. Um, and there's obviously like less mediation between developers and publishers that goes through journalists now. It's like Notch has a million Twitter followers. Um, and there are all these sort of cultural problems that kind of came out of that. Um, and then finally, um, yeah, I talked about new games journalism and, and that frame. And it's a really, really good frame if you're at all interested in it. There's, there's a ton of really good stuff out there um, from, that's sort of written in the new games journalism sort of vein. And it doesn't always have to be like pure experiential, but yeah, it tends to be really good. Um, so that's it. If you have any questions, feel free to come and ask me stuff. And uh, we'll see you guys after the break.